So welcome to another episode of Making Imagination. I'm Wes Morrell with Morrell Imagination. Today, I'm very excited for this interview. I'll be talking with uh, Alfredo Sirica, uh, who's a composer. We're we'll talking about uh, composing for animation specifically today. Um, he's done a lot of compositions. Um, he's composed for video games, feature films, TV series, uh, animation, animated shorts. Um, he's also done uh, some music supervision, uh, which we'll get into a little bit, and orchestration, including Batman v Superman. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm very excited to speak with you, uh, Alfredo. Um, yeah, so thanks again for doing this. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and also great job pronouncing my last name. Not, not even Italians often are able to do it. Usually they say Sirica. They put the accent on the last I. So great job. Thank you. Oh, good. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so my first question, um, you are a composer. You have been um, for some years. Um, you're pretty young. I'm kind of curious, how did you become a composer? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think I have the, the, the enormous luck of um, having chosen and having discovered what I was really passionate about at a very, very young age. So I had the proper time to absorb my passion, make it mine and study um, and being able to sort of build my basis quite um, early up. So when it was, you know, and especially at that time, I also had the ambition uh, of youth. And so even without, you know, maybe having a, a classical um, sort of background that I then actually uh, pursued and uh, that I then studied, I just started uh, sending out my music to, uh, directors, producers. And once I bumped into this um, online competition, this, this online audition to become the composer for uh, this feature film called uh, Porsches and, and Private Eyes by Running Wild Films directed by Travis Mills. And this was about 2015. I participated, uh, luckily, uh, you know, maybe no one participated just me and so I won <laughs> and um, that's how I actually started my um, composition career with, with that feature film <clears throat> which uh, got into theaters in 2016 and since then I've uh, had the luck of being contacted by various companies directors and uh, collaborating on, on projects that uh, I'm honored to have collaborated on I'm curious. Some of some of your um, tunes have had a, a little bit kind of a almost kind of a haunting quality. Something that tugs at the hearts um, in a special way. Um, is that something you think about consciously, or is that kind of how you think about music and how you compose and that just sort of naturally what comes out or how do you kind of, I guess what I'm getting at is, is how have you found your style and is that something you're still working on or pursuing or? Of course, um, of course, every composer has his own voice. Um, but then again, also every movie has his own voice. And uh, as composers, even though maybe we have our own style and we'd like, uh, you know, naturally some kind of music would come out, we always have to adapt to the style and genre of the movie. So whatever I put out, which is also the thing that I mostly love doing, is always something that is in service of a story, of a story that someone else thought. And so even though I do have my own style, which um, as you've heard is very melodic, I, I really, really enjoy um, other than creating uh, atmospheres and building a, a musical world for movies. I also have this kind of traditional approach when I can, obviously I can't adapt it to, to every movie, but whenever I'm allowed, whenever they let me have fun, um, I really, really enjoy just creating this, having this more traditional approach, having light motifs, um, having 
main themes for every character. And um, I, I do think that's what adds the emotion. Um, because when you have an atmosphere, when you have a style, uh, when, when you say things in a certain way, in a, in a, in a sort of a charming way, and when you also have content, you know, words that uh, come out of the music, I, I, that's what I try to pursue, of course. Uh, I have my limitations, I'm never going to achieve what I would like. Uh, but at least that's what I always try to do. And, and of course, if I don't have, I, I'm my own biggest cr critic. So if I don't have, uh, if I don't get chills while listening to one of my tracks, I would never put it out. Yeah, I do. I. It's interesting you say that because I tend to think, um, at least lately, it seems like melody um, is often missing in a lot of um, more recent soundtracks. I think there's been a move um, more for tone and mood than for melody. I think, I think personally, it seems to me that the 90s were much, much bigger on melody um, and sort of crossing over into the 2000s, you have more mood and tone. And I think that works perfectly um, for a lot of the pictures um, that end up using those kinds of scores. But I think uh, in terms of separating those scores later, um, at least in my opinion, um, it's been a little bit uh, harder to just listen to some of that music. Um, I much prefer, um, I wish there were more composers who were still leaning into kind of melody, I think in, in their writing. Of course, yeah, that's what I was referring to when I was saying that they don't always let me have fun. So, you know, quite often, the thing is, I think, um, you know, movies have started to take uh, a more realistic and minimalistic approach. And I think that's why actually music and animation work so much better together than live action and, uh, and music, because they have one thing in common, which is exaggeration. Um, you know, Isaishi, the, the composer um, for the amazing movies uh, by Studio Ghibli, Howl's Moving Castle, Spirited Away, and also Princess Mononoke. Ah, <laughs> yes. I have a themed uh, t-shirt. He <laughs> says that um, music is the most fictional part in a movie. Um, and he's right. He's absolutely right. You know, anything that happens in a movie, most of it could happen in real life. You could have epic romances. One day, uh, science, the, the, the evolution of science could gift us with uh, spaceships. But, you know, as absurd as a world we're seeing in a, in a movie, like even the world of the Lord of the Rings isn't as absurd as a world where music accompanies the action of each one of us. You know, that, that's the most fictional part of a film. I mean, obviously our brain doesn't register it, it doesn't register it as wrong. Quite often we don't even notice when the music starts in a film because that's just another way of storytelling and we are so used and we are so prone to storytelling. But obviously movies, live action movies, who go more towards realism, they can't quite afford to uh, unbalance that realism with music. On the other hand, animation, it is exaggerated by nature. Uh, you know, every single action, every single facial expression, um, it has to be emphasized in order to be believable. Because once you have a style, you have to go all the way with it. Otherwise, you fall into the uncanny valley. And so the exaggeration of animation and the exaggeration of a music accompaniment, they merge incredibly well together. That's really interesting. I've considered the uncanny zone, um, artistically speaking or technologically speaking, but I've never considered it in, in the context of music. Um, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, kind of moving into animation. Uh, <laughs> I can't pronounce this one, this one uh, animated television show you worked on, uh, Lampadina E. It's this one. <laughs> yes, yes. <that's> <laughs> the card right here in my office. 
yes, yes. Yeah, in listening to some of that music, um, I it seemed like there was a little bit of extra sophistication um, within the music itself that is not true of all <laughs> children's program music, um, which I think makes it more pleasant to listen to. Was that something you consciously went about doing? Um, thank you. Um, okay, you know, first of all, obviously, we always have to have respect for, for every kind of audience that we're talking to. So even if it's children, um, we don't have, doesn't mean we have to deteriorate the quality of what we're doing. Obviously, it has to be something that can be accessible and that doesn't bore children. Um, but at the same time, you should be able to do the best you can with the audience that you have. And you should never underestimate your audience. But this cartoon in particular is special because um, so obviously most of your audience won't know about it because it's an Italian cartoon. It's on Italian TV. Uh, the name is Lampadino e Caramella. Um, and it is really the first product uh, of its kind because it's uh, supposed to be the first cartoon and the first animated series accessible to all children. So also those with um, disabilities like uh, so also deaf children, blind children, children with autism. So this means that um, every single part, every, every single layer of the cartoon needs to be understandable alone individually you know if you have just access to the images or if you have just access to the music so of course when it comes to blind people to blind children the music was crucial it was incredibly um, it's incredibly important so i had to work on creating this hopefully very immersive atmosphere very immersive music and um, also giving um, to the children auditory images you know children who didn't have visual images i, I could hopefully give them give them uh, auditory ones and also give them auditory signals it really does serve as a, as a second narrator we used also the you know the technique um, used for um, Peter and the Wolf by Prokofiev. So uh, for every character, we have an instrument, we have a theme. There are over 30, may, uh, over 30 light motifs for over 30 characters. This time I, I really had fun <laughs> with what I like doing in a product. So um, that's why it feels different because it is a different kind of cartoon. That's interesting. I, I, I completely agree with um, that kind of philosophy where um, music is itself a storytelling piece. Um, I think the more often we recall that, I think the better off we'll be. Um, I think everything is a storytelling piece um, in film and, and cinema. Um, I'm curious, you've worked with several different, um, I guess, studios in various countries, Italy, for instance, uh, the United States, um, France, uh, Mexico. Are those very different experiences in general or are they very universal and how does that tend to work? Um, does everyone speak English? Do you speak uh, multiple different kinds of languages? How do you guys, how do you guys, um, well, communicate practically speaking, but also just artistically, um, you know, do those various countries come with different musical sensibilities or is it, or is the, the, the project and the the ideas behind the project just sort of universal? Um, so first of all, in regards to the languages, I only speak uh, you know, Italian, English, and a bit of German. So, and I, I never worked with a German studio. So of course, for every other studio I worked with, I had the luck of collaborating with people who could speak and understand English. And when it comes to the work attitude i think of course you know 
every country you collaborate with, you're doing the same thing. You're, you're trying to create, to, to, to tell a story through uh, the cinematic medium or the animated medium. What changes is not that, it's not what you're doing, but maybe the mentalities behind it and the styles. So um, in Italy, for example, we have uh, the, the mentality is more tailored towards the screenplay, the dialogues. Um, things are very dialogue centered. Uh, American pieces, they are much more frenetic. Um, they, they, they try to always get the audience interested and entertained. Uh, with France, they really care about charm and style uh, and elegance. So what changes is not what you're doing, but the style, the direction you take while you're doing it. That's really interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, I think of you first as a composer, but you do have uh, some other credits to your name, like orchestrator um, or music supervisor. What's different about those roles? Um, and, and where is their crossover, you being a composer? Or does that help you? Um, and are a lot of these are a lot of these sort of the same thing? You are a composer where you are also a music supervisor and vice versa? Orchestration is sort of one part of composition. Um, composition is a huge world. It's a huge role. It covers the composition itself. Uh, so uh, coming up with melodies and harmonies that accompany those melodies. Uh, but also establishing the orchestration, the timbre, uh, that is composition as well. Um, orchestrating all the tracks, uh, writing down all the tracks, directing the orchestra, and that's what the, uh, also, also producing the tracks, mixing them. These are all things that the composer uh, for movies does, the composer for, for uh, cinema and TV series does. But quite often, since the work is in such a huge amount and many composers have a lot of projects that they take at once because they get excited, they accept them and then, you know, they get in panic and realize they took more than they could handle because every project that comes along is a, is a new excitement, is a new stimulation for us. Um, and so quite often, you know, they take the, they keep the main, part of composition, the, the center, which is composing the melody and harmonies. And they hand the other parts to their collaborators. So when, uh, usually I, I, I've never done this. I don't really like um, handing my own baby to other people. You know, once I start with it, I have to go all the way with it and, and follow my vision. But quite often, you know, when I've been an orchestrator for other people, I've had to take their melodies, their harmonies, understand what their vision was for it, and adapt my uh, orchestration knowledge and orchestration uh, creativeness to their music. On the other hand, when it comes to music supervision, I simply have to, that's the most fun I usually have, because you know, it, it, your role is basically judging what other people do. They have most of the job. You're just there to say, this works or this doesn't. Try to do it differently. And um, it's fun because for once, you know, you take revenge on all the times that the directors have told, you know, please change this whole week of work that you've done. Uh, change this whole five minute section of music that you composed and for once you know it's cathartic <laughs> for you to be the one doing it very interesting <laughs> in addition to uh the cinematic scene over the last couple of decades changing and becoming more global um at least more accessible through um platforms like zoom and skype and things synthetic music has become more and more realistic um, and better sounding over time and so um at least from my perspective, raising attention between um, live orchestra or a computer program where, com where a composer just sits down and does things. And I think budget probably did, dictates a lot of those things where, can we afford the live orchestra? Okay, let's go for it. Can we not? Okay, we're gonna go with something smaller. 
what are some of the kind of differences between um, doing an orchestra um, versus versus doing synthetic? Um, are there ever times where you might try to blend the two? Um, and kind of what would be the benefit of that? You know, obviously, like with everything, humans have to adapt. And um, we've also had to adapt to um, the, the, the diminution, the, the decrease of budgets. Um, that's something that's unfortunately happening. It's true also because today we have so many more productions than there were years ago. You know, years ago you had TV and movies. Um, those were the only productions. Today you have so much stuff with Netflix, Amazon, uh, Hulu, uh, and such. So many more things are getting produced, but also those things have to divide the budget that once only one of those projects would have had. And so when it comes to the budget, synthetic orchestra is a lifesaver because you can actually achieve an amazing result, a very believable result with just your computer, which really does let you give high quality and, and a high visual and auditory impact to a movie that probably didn't even cost anything. And so you can do a lot with nothing. So when people say that there, there isn't an excuse, it is true. Um, today you really have no excuse to actually go out and, and put your stuff out there. You have no limitations. But even though it's not necessary, live orchestra will always be the preferred route to go with. Obviously, you know, whenever you're the one programming the orchestra, you're the one deciding everything. Uh, the timber, the velocity, the dynamics of every instrument. But this means that there is no human element and there is no musician who can put his own soul into uh, the music. There is no musician who can surprise you with his own performance. And also it does digital music, synthetic music, it does also affect the emotional delivery of the track. Of course, there are some incredible digital libraries that emulate instruments incredibly well, but as well as, as amazing as they can be, they will never achieve, at least now they haven't achieved the level of uh, live musicians. So whenever you have a medium budget, that's when you can actually try and mix the two, hopefully. So you create the, the most expensive part, the orchestral part, the orchestral accompaniment. You create it with digital instruments, and then you hire live musicians who perform the solo parts, who can add emotion where emotion is needed. And that's really interesting. You bring up being surprised by what a performer um, can bring to performance. Just as a director, I've, I've experienced it in the uh, recording booth. And I've thought, this is the way it's said, this is the way it's performed. And then an actor will get into the booth and read it differently. <laughs> uh, and very often, um, in a more interesting way, in a way that I that just surprised me. Last question, uh, you mentioned uh, Isaishi for uh, the Studio Ghibli films. His music is very um, beautiful and uh, cathartic uh, and serene. I'm kind of curious, um, question's kind of twofold, maybe it's two questions. Um, who are some of those composers uh, you really look up to um, just in terms of just inspiration and that sort of thing? And what kinds of projects uh, are you, are you, would you just love to get to score? So I have these three stars that I usually look up to and try to follow uh, despite my huge limitations. And they are John Powell for the power he puts in his music. He's, uh, you know, the way he uses orchestration in, his, in such a knowledgeable way uh, his scores for How to Train Your Dragon, his collaborations with Hans Zimmer in Kung Fu Panda, they are simply incredible. The power, the adrenaline they give you, 
and also the memorable melodies, they are simply amazing. Then of course, Isai Isaishi, for the immersion he can actually give you, um, the, the way he can actually put you inside. The most amazing thing about Studio Ghibli films is the atmosphere. The way they can completely pull you out of your world and immerse you in this new one. It's incredible. And, you know, a huge part of it is thanks to Isaishi. And then Alexander Desplat for the elegance. Alexander Desplat has such a simple yet effective way of composing. His um, score for Fantastic Mr. Fox, the animated film by Wes Anderson, is incredible. Um, and, you know, it's simple melodies. It's such but they are so elegant and so effective in their own uh, simplicity. So, this trick. And is that the kind of project you love to work on? Something that's really um, immersive and um, with kind of a, a mix of all that? What, what, what would you just love to compose for? You know, there are two genres that um, I really love composing for. One of them is really weird because it's actually the genre that I enjoy watching the least, which is fantasy. And that's because unless it's done incredibly well, I can rarely manage to get myself immersed in, uh, in that world. I usually just watch it and say, well, yeah, sure. But why should I be interested about something that doesn't exist? That's just me, I, I work long. <laughs> I am a, I'm a very old soul, um, but at the same time, I enjoy so much trying to pull other people into this world that is that doesn't exist. Uh, trying to craft those atmospheres, and also, whenever you work in a fantasy, you know it's a world that didn't exist before, and it is created by scratch for uh, this new story and. Likewise, you have to create a new musical world uh, in order for it to be as effective as can be and to be completely merged with the, the story and the, the narrative world. And another kind of genre I would, I, I really love and enjoy working on is um, historical dramas. Because, you know, again, I was talking before about uh, music in movies getting more and more minimalistic as the movies get more realistic. But it looks like one of the few exceptions nowadays is um, historical dramas, uh, because they are supposed, they, they are sort of like, since it's not our real world, um, they are supposed to pull you into a world that you didn't even, you, you weren't even born uh before uh, it, it existed and so uh you do have to sort of approach and recreate that musical world that musical planet and uh try and pull people into the past which is very much like fantasy in that sense ah uh, very interesting very interesting uh that is really interesting um I, and i think personally a great philosophy for a composer to have um, just going back to um, something you mentioned earlier with Kung Fu Panda with uh, John Powell and, and Hans uh, Zimmer, I think there there is not a boring note in that score. It is just it, it's all meaningful. It's all deliberate. It's all um, moving things forward um, in an interesting way. Uh, you know, we have a saying in Italy which goes, "The wise people are the most silent." And that's because they only speak when they have something to say. You know, they, they value other people's time and other people's energy. And I feel like people like John Powell, that's what they do. Uh, they only put a track out there if they think it's worth listening to. That's why it's so special. Alfredo, I have very, very much enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thanks so much for your time, man. Uh, I, I hope we can work together in the future. Likewise, yes, it would be amazing. Thanks again for having me. Uh, again, I hope I wasn't a waste of your time. 
Um, but they had so much fun and uh, I was honored to, to be featured on this episode.